yeah uh, now we have the recording okay we will uh, begin with today's class so we did two of the major prophets last week we looked at isaiah and jeremiah today we'll cover the remaining three major prophets which would be lamentations ezekiel and daniel so um maybe we can start off with lamentations what exactly are lamentations they are people crying out to god expressing their pain expressing their suffering asking him to help them uh, you know so these are the things which would be mentioned in a lament in the psalms you have many laments uh, for example psalm 10 uh, is it's a lament psalm in which the psalmist is crying out to god and he is lamenting let's look at that as an example psalm 10 then we will have a better understanding of what exactly lamentations involve um so if we were to turn in our uh, and if we could have someone read out for us just the first two verses psalm 10 verses 1 and 2 what do we see written over there Psalm 10, verse 1 and 2. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. Yeah. So here in these first two verses, um, the psalmist begins his lament by saying, "Why do you stand far off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble?" he says you know the wicked people are hunting down the weak uh, they are, they are uh, scheming against the helpless people so lord why are you so far away why didn't you come and bring justice why didn't you help us so a lament is like a cry of protest saying lord we are suffering please could you act please could you do something on our behalf so a lament will have a cry of protest it will also have a cry saying lord please come and do something act on our behalf uh, so in psalm 10 that would basically be verse 12 where the psalmist says arise lord lift up your hand o god do not forget the helpless so he's crying out to god to come and intervene a lament will also uh, usually have words of hope so not only is it the person crying out and protesting not only is he saying lord come and do something he also expresses trust and faith Uh, like here in Psalm 10, if you were to look at verses 17 and 18, here the psalmist says, "Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted; you encourage them, and you listen to their cry." So he's uh, asserting his faith and saying, "I know, Lord, that we are going through a difficult time right now, but I know you will hear our cry and you will respond." So uh, laments are something that are familiar. you know uh, and there are common in the bible and uh, here in the book of lamentations you have an entire book devoted to this uh, this form of writing you know uh, this lament form of writing so here in the book of lamentations we see the people crying out in protest because they have now been exiled they have been taken away by nebuchadnezzar as slaves and many have been killed in fact you know when the when the invasion took place uh, a lot of people were killed and uh, before the invasion uh, for two years there was complete star you know starvation because the there's a siege had been laid all around the uh, jerusalem city so they have gone through very tough times so now you know they are crying out in this book of lamentations and saying lord why did you allow all this why have you put you know uh, put us under such uh, oppression it's also a way of expressing their emotions all the pain that is there in their heart um a lot of people feel better when they express it out loud in words rather than just keeping the feelings inside when someone expresses it out verbally in words or puts it down in writing it makes them feel a little better it's a way to vent your emotions to to allow what is inside to come out and it makes you feel a little better so a lamentation is also a cry of um of of emotions you know where you are bringing it all out and expressing it before god 
and um, of course it's also uh, laments also express a lot of confusion um, because the person is wondering why am i going through this what is happening why is god not hearing why is he not answering so a lament is something that you and i can also write today of course it will not be entered into the bible it will not be considered an inspired scripture but it is a good way of expressing ourselves all you need are these three ingredients where you frankly express your confusion before god and say lord why is this happening no what's going on so you you express your confusion before the lord and you also express your emotions you say lord i'm feeling this if you're feeling angry you express your anger uh, if you're feeling hurt about something you express your hurt so you express your emotions and then you end with words of hope saying lord i'm i'm going through this but one thing i know lord i know who you are i know uh, your character i know your faithfulness so lord in, even though i'm going through this i know that one day you will bring me out of this so you can write your own laments you don't have to be a poet it doesn't have to rhyme in english there's a lot of emphasis on you no know, rhyme uh, because at least earlier i mean english rhymes uh, had to rhyme the last word of each uh, you know uh, line has to rhyme for instance twinkle twinkle little star it has to go with i wonder who you are so star and r have to rhyme but you know in most even including even in hebrew poetry they couldn't care less about rhyming the words for them it's more um, a parallel thoughts one thought has to match the next thought so it's for them it's that kind of poetry so a lament is a healthy way of expressing what we are feeling inside it's a way of it's a prayer almost of us crying out to god and if you put in scriptural words of hope in it it is also biblical in the sense you're not just giving in to despair you're also affirming your faith and saying yes i'm feeling all these emotions yes i'm going through all this confusion but at the end of it i know who you are i know what you will do for me so a lament can become a beautiful form of prayer and this is what we see over here in the book of lamentations where jeremiah is writing out this book almost as if it is a kind of a funeral song you know in those days when someone passes away when someone dies they would you know if that person is important they would compose a song in his honor and they would sing it out so here it's almost as if jeremiah is writing a funeral song for jerusalem which has fallen jerusalem which has been destroyed it is his funeral song which he is composed for jerusalem and god is weeping through him because this is not just a song written by a human this is inspired scripture so it's like as if god himself is crying out for jerusalem through this man jeremiah who has written this book of lamentations so we not only see the pain of the people reflected in these words we can almost hear god himself feeling uh, the hurt of what has happened to his city and his beloved people all right so we should look at uh, the book of lamentations from that angle where even the lord is involved in the process of mourning for this fallen city um coming to the structure of lamentations um now this is lamentations was by hearted by the people you know once uh, jeremiah wrote it the people uh, in exile by hearted it they would recite it they would sing it out so for the sake of um, memory uh, you know uh, they composed each of the chapters in acrostic form we looked at that word acrostic we we defined it and does anyone remember what an acrostic is an acrostic is basically where you're using an alphabetical order which makes it easier to remember so in the psalms you have acrostic psalms where you have uh, each uh, uh, al alphabet being used to start that particular verse so here in lamentations as well we have uh, an acrostic form being used in chapters 1 chapter 2 in chapter 4 in chapter 3 Uh, also you have acrostic but then there are 66 verses so every third verse will start the next alphabet 
so they were composed in this manner so that people will be able to by heart them and be able to sing them remember them um so in lamentations 1 you basically have um the picture of jerusalem as a woman she is called the daughter of uh, zion and she is also described as a widow it's like as if her husband has you know left her and gone away the lord who has who chose to enter into a covenant with her has now left her and he is gone so it's as if now she has become a widow and she no longer has support and so this daughter of Zion is weeping and crying. So if you look at that entire chapter, it's like as if she's crying out and she's expressing her pain and saying, Lord, once upon a time, I had so many friends. I had so many lovers because you see, she was an adulterous woman. This Jerusalem, instead of saying, staying faithful to the Lord God, she went after the idols. She went after other pagan gods. So, uh, so she's saying once upon a time, I had so many friends, I had so many lovers. Now, nobody even looks at me, even though I'm crying out for help. So uh, if you look at that entire chapter one, there's so much emotion, there's so much pain, there's so much despair being expressed by this daughter of Zion, who has you know, reduced herself to this state. Um, maybe we could have someone read out just the two verses, uh, Lamentations chapter one, verses one and two. This is how the entire book of Lamentations starts off. Lamentations 1, verses 1 and 2, please. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow is she. How was great among the nation. The princess among the provinces has, be has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Yeah, so it says bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. But all her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. Uh, so Lamentations chapter 1 is talking about um, Jerusalem as though she is a person. Lamentations 2, the main focus is upon the anger of God, the judgment of God. Whenever in the Bible we talk about the anger of God, it's not God just having a temper tantrum. It's not just God being short-tempered. God is never short-tempered. Like, like he clearly explains in Exodus, he's long-tempered. It takes a long time for him to become angry. He patiently waits. So in, whenever we talk about God's anger, it's not God just bursting out whenever he's in a bad mood. It is God expressing justice when the time comes for judgment. Until then, he holds himself back. However upset he may be with the people, he does not take it out on them. He waits for the appointed time and only then his anger and wrath is expressed. So here, in Lamentations 2, we see that the time came for the judgment to arrive because the people again and again refused to repent. And so now, finally, God expresses his anger. Because you see, in all the nations which were surrounding Israel at that time, they would have all these gods and goddesses which they worshipped in those nations. And those gods and goddesses were quite a bad-tempered lot. You know, they would get into fights with each other. They would take out... Um, um, they would take out their anger on human beings by sending lightning. So these are the kind of stories and legends which they had in their religions. But Yahweh was very, very different. His anger was only expressed uh, when the time, correct time came to bring judgment, to bring justice. So um, we see that the Lord's anger is very different from the kind of anger which the other religions believed in. Lamentations 3 is like at the center of this uh, you know, book um, because Lamentations 3 is where it talks about the words of hope. It is a prayer asking for the mercy of the Lord. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Lamentations 3 is at the very center. Um, we have you know, words and phrases in this particular chapter taken from Job chapter 3, uh, from Psalm 22, from Psalm 69, from Isaiah 53. You know, small terms and phrases have been picked up from uh, the different 
uh, scriptures and used over here in this Lamentations chapter 3. Uh, and then you move into Lamentations chapter 4, uh, where you have a description of what happened during those two years, you know, when the Babylonians laid a siege around the city. They blocked off the entrances. Nobody could go out. Nobody could come in without the permission of the Babylonians. So, which is why the food supply inside the city began to run out slowly till finally there was complete famine, complete shortage. People were like literally starving. Uh, so, um, during those two years when all this was going on, the people are trapped inside. The Babylonian army is strong and powerful, waiting outside. And Jeremiah is prophesying in that kind of a situation and saying, surrender, surrender, go outside to the gates, surrender to the Babylonians. And that is why the king is so angry and he says, why are you talking against your own people? Why are you asking us to surrender to our enemy? And Jeremiah says, it is because the time for your judgment has come. Submit to the Lord because now is the time of judgment. And so the people are, you know, uh, angry with him at that point of time. So Lamentations 4 talks about what happened during those two years of siege when they were trapped inside the city. It gives a contrast of different things, how the rich became poor, how the powerful are now weak and helpless. Uh, maybe we can just look at one example. Um, uh, chapter 4, verses 4 to 5, if someone could read out. Lamentations 4, 4 and 5. The tongue of the infant clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one break it for them. Those who ate it delicious are, are desolate in the street. Those who were brought up in scarlet embrace a shapes. So here in verses 4 and 5, you have a contrast being drawn between how the children were before and in what condition the children are now. So the royal children, you know, they were clothed in royal purple and uh, they were eating delicacies. They were eating the best food. Now, what are those children doing? They are begging for bread. Uh, so, um, you know, the and in uh, verses 7 and 8, there's a contrast drawn between the nobles and the aristocrats. It describes them as being whiter than milk earlier. But now in uh, verse 8, it says they are blacker than uh, suit. Suit is basically your, um, what do you, um, you know, when you have, uh, um, when you have, when you light a fire and then you have the black uh, residue which forms on the sides, you know, because of the smoke which is coming, that smoke, uh, uh, you know, residue, that's basically called suit. Uh, so uh, earlier they were like whiter than milk, now they are blacker than suit. And then it says their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as a stick. Whereas earlier, earlier their bodies were, uh, the word used over there is R-U-D-D-Y. It just basically means they were healthy and plump and strong. Whereas now their, you know, their skin has shriveled up and it's sticking to their bones. So Lamentations 4 describes the two years of siege which was there um, around Jerusalem. And then finally you come to Lamentations 5. It's, it's like a prayer being offered to God saying, Lord, we have gone through all this. So kindly, please restore us. And so in uh, you know chapter 5, if you could just read out verses 1 and 2. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our house to fo foreigners. Yeah, so the prayer begins with these words. Remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers. Other people have taken over our land. So, oh Lord, please look upon us and, you know, help us. And then in the, in the, if you look at the ending, that this is how the book of Lamentations ends with these words. Uh, if someone could read out verses 19 to 22. Chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. You, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Unless you have utterly rejected us, 
and are very angry with us. So the end of the uh, book of Lamentations doesn't really end with positive words. It ends with a question mark. Lord, are you so angry with us that you're going to forget us forever? But Lord, we are hoping that you will restore us. It just kind of ends like that, you know, where it says, restore us to yourself, Lord. You know, uh, the, uh, the um, writer says in verse 21. And then verse 22, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure, unless that is the case, could you please restore us? So it's like as if these people for five chapters, they have cried out to the Lord, expressed all their pain, expressed all their confusion. And now in the, in the end, they're saying, now, Lord, we have poured out our heart. And yes, we admit that we have been sinful. Now, Lord, the ball is in your court. Now it's up to you. You decide in your justice and wisdom what you want to do with us. If you, have, if you will have mercy upon us, please restore us. So... Um, this, I think, is a healthy way to approach the Lord. We should not go to him and make demands and say, Lord, you should do this for me. You know, you must work out things for me in this particular way. It's good for us to pour out everything there is in our heart, our hopes, our shattered dreams, uh, uh, the pain that we are feeling, uh, the, you know, um, the wrong things that have been done to us by the enemies, everything. We pour it all out and then we conclude and say, Lord, do it your way. I'm leaving it in your hands. You know, so I think that is probably a positive way of let, leaving things in the Lord's hands for him to do his almighty will. So Lamentations actually ends in that manner. Now, um, at the very center of the book of Lamentations is basically where you have Lamentations chapter 3, where you have these words, beautiful words, which are so familiar. I mean, we're all very familiar about the mercies of the Lord being new every morning, right? I mean, uh, uh, we, it's there in our songs. We use it in our sermons. This is basically where that thing comes in from, from Lamentations chapter 3. So in Lamentations chapter 3, if you look at verses 16 to 21, over there, um, it's like as if a man, is, you know, he's, he's crying out. It's like the uh, in the first chapter, it was daughter Zion who was crying out. Here you have the picture of a man who's like in a completely uh, broken down condition and he is crying out to God. So these are his words. This is how it is expressed. Um, so this uh, this person in, in verse 16, he's saying he has, you know, he's talking about what the Lord has done to him. Um, and over, over here, of course, you know, he's personifying the entire nation. So it's not just him. It's the entire nation which upon which judgment has come. And this is what um, uh, this person says. Um, he say, here the writer is writing, The Lord has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. Now, this is the picture of a person who's like literally being crushed into the ground. So, you know, you can imagine uh, the enemy comes. Uh, like, you know, on the battlefield, when someone falls to the ground, what does the enemy do? He comes and literally crushes them with his, you know, with his uh, shoes. He just crushes them into the ground. So it's like your face is pressed into the ground and the, the dirt and the gravel which is there on the ground is breaking your teeth. It's gone into your mouth. And so that is the imagery over here. So it's talking about complete crushing. He has broken my teeth with gravel. That is, your face is pressed into the ground, and that's why the gravel is going into your mouth and breaking your teeth. And he has trampled me in the dust. And then in verse 10, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, verse 18, it says, So I say, my splendor is gone. All that I hoped for from the Lord, you know, it's all gone. I mean, um, uh, so he's talking about the, his complete, uh, you know, downtrodden condition where all the splendor which he had earlier, all the hopes which he had entertained earlier, all of that is completely gone. And then he says in verse 19, I remember my affliction and my wandering. Yeah, and, and he says in verse 20, I remember them and my soul is downcast. So he says, I've gone through all this. My face was pressed into the mud. The gravel actually went into my mouth and broke my teeth. All this has happened to me. And when I remember all that I have gone through, he says, you know, my, my affliction, when I remember it, my soul is downcast. So this is the way I am right now. 
this is the kind of judgment that came upon me and now this is the condition i am in and every time i think about all the things that were done to me by the lord i feel very very downcast then come these amazing words verse 21 yet this i call to mind and therefore i have hope so when i am feeling in this helpless broken state at that time yet this is what i remember this is what i recall to my mind and this is what gives me hope what is it that gives him hope verse 22 it says because of the lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness so he admits all that he has gone through and he admits that when he thinks about what has happened to him his soul is downcast and when he's feeling depressed in that way he doesn't give in to the depression and say oh my life is finished no when he's in that depressed downcast condition he says yet i call to mind you know who the lord is what kind of a god he is and he, he says, this is the kind of God, this, this, this is what he's reminding himself of. And he says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's great love, you know, uh, is never consumed. His compassions never fail. And the thing about his faithfulness is, is about his mercy is every morning there will be some new mercy. You may be in the most downtrodden condition, but every morning there will be a new set of mercies awaiting you. This is the faithfulness of our God. And he, then he goes on to say in verse um, 24, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. You know, who is our inheritance? It's not the wealth and the power and the influence. The Lord himself is our inheritance. So because the Lord is my inheritance, therefore i will wait for him yes i am being punished right now you know this is uh, you know um, the the people of jerusalem it's like as if they are speaking so they are saying it's true that we have been punished by the lord but we will wait because we know one thing the compassions of the lord they will not fail his mercies will be new every morning so he says i will patiently wait and then it, you know it goes on to say in verse 27 it is good for a man to hear, to, to, to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him. So he's saying, okay, we are going through this time of, uh, of punishment and judgment. Yes, Lord, we will submit to it. We are the ones who brought this upon ourselves. Again and again, you gave us a chance to repent. We chose not to. So therefore, this has come upon us. Now we will humbly submit to this. We will be like the young man who sits in silence and allows the judgment to come upon him. Why? Because he is paying the price for what he did. He chose to ignore the Lord's voice, which is why this has now happened to him. Uh, but... He continues to hold on to this thought. He says, why am I willing to submit like this? Verse 31, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. The Lord never casts anybody off forever. And then he says, though the Lord brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. And then there's this beautiful verse in verse 33 where it says, for the Lord does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. It's a fact. The Lord does not willingly bring grief to anyone. It's only either because we have done something and now temporarily we are suffering the consequences of what we have done, or it may be something that God permits, like in the case of Job, because there are bigger things, factors at work, and we do not, do not know, we are not aware of all that is involved. But the point is this, God does not willingly make anyone suffer. He only allows it for a temporary season to accomplish whatever purpose for which it has been permitted. But beyond that, his mercies are still there. His compassion is still there. So at the, at the heart of this book of Lamentations is this passage of great hope. And so this should be our attitude during our times of trial and suffering. 
Now, sometimes the suffering may come as a result of our own wrong decisions, the wrong choices that we have made. It can even be because of the sin that we have been living in. So, you know, we are suffering the consequences of that. Sometimes it may, may be innocent. It may be other people who are evil, who are doing bad things to us. So it could be different cases. But in all of our suffering, this is a good way to approach the Lord. It is good to remember that he is this kind of a compassionate God. And we can assure ourselves and say, even though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. We can have these words of assurance always, no matter what our circumstances may be. So the book of Lamentations is actually a book of much hope. Even though it is focusing on pain and suffering, it is a book which is offering us um, a, a, a kind of pattern that we can use you know, when we are approaching the Lord. Uh, why? Because we see that Jeremiah um, wrote this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to show us that when we are in pain, God weeps along with us and God also wants us to continue to have hope. And so later, you know, um, Jeremiah is not the only one who wept over Jerusalem. There was someone else also who came in the future and he also wept over Jerusalem. Of course, we are talking about Jesus, you know, in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. That is basically where we see that Jesus also weeps over the city. And he's, he talks about in uh, Luke 19, verse 43, he says, the enemies will build an embankment against you. You know, they will come and surround you, it says, and encircle you and hem you in on every side. So what happened in the time of the Babylonians? It will happen again. So Jesus says, you know, and it actually was fulfilled. What Jesus told was fulfilled in AD 70. Uh, when the Romans come, they surround the city, they burn the, uh, the temple. So, um, you know, whatever Jesus prophesied, it, it all came to pass. But Jesus was not happy about it. He wept when he, when he prophesied about what's going to happen. And, you know, that's basically where uh, he, he speaks, you know, those, uh, those words of hope. And he says, how many times I wanted to gather you under my wings, but you people were not interested. And because of that, this is going to come upon you. you know, so, um, so both Jeremiah and Jesus weep over Jerusalem. They express love towards Jerusalem and hope for the future. So yes, right now judgment will be coming, but still, in, in spite of all that is going to happen, there is still hope for the future. That is what is uh, expressed over here. So um, we were able to very briefly look at the book of Lamentations. Uh, let's move into the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel uh, is considered by most people a rather complicated book, simply because it has all these visions um, in which it describes all kinds of strange creatures with multiple wings and multiple eyes and multiple heads even, and uh, multiple wheels and all kinds of things uh, which are difficult to describe in human words. So the things which Ezekiel sees in his vision are so complicated and so unlike anything that, we, that exists over here in our earthly realm that he's unable to even find the correct words to express what, he, to describe what he is seeing. So um, it's that kind of a complicated vision which Ezekiel has. Okay, so um, um, maybe to start off with, who was Ezekiel? Um, as we know, Nebuchadnezzar comes three times, takes away the people from, uh, from uh, Judah and Jerusalem in three different batches. In the very first batch, uh, when the main uh, aristocrats and officials are being taken away, Daniel also is taken away. In the second batch, when people are being taken away, that is when you have Ezekiel being taken away. So he's basically from the priestly, uh, from the priestly clan. And uh, so, he, you know, in chapter 1, verse 3, we get to know that he's the son of Buzi, a priest. And uh, so uh, in the second batch, Ezekiel is taken away as an exile, which means the third final collapse of Jerusalem has not yet happened. 
so this this uh, book of ezekiel is being written in that kind of time period all right so um so from 592 bc up to 585 bc is probably when he wrote the first 39 chapters all right so uh, then they say that most probably uh, the last few chapters chapter 40 to 48 uh, would have been written at a much later period of time is what you know most of the commentaries will say uh, so uh, the first portion you know which was written uh, chapters 1 to 39 in the first three chapters you see him being commissioned by god uh, to go and prophesy then chapters 4 to 24 you have a series of parables of judgment different kinds of parables are used to talk about the judgment which will come upon jerusalem very very soon okay so um, you have many parables in chapters 4 to 24 then in chapters 25 to 32 uh, judgment is given against seven um, gentile nations so chapters 25 to 32 is a series of judgments spoken against seven nations ammon moab edom philistia and and, and the others um, then chapters 33 to 39 is where um, ezekiel speaks about how god will restore in the future so it talks it, it it provides words of hope which will occur later on in the future and so in this uh, small section chapters 33 to 39 that is basically where you have that famous passage about the valley of the dry bones so that is a uh, a, a vision which is given to uh, ezekiel so in chapter 37 he sees as if he's standing in a valley and he can see the bones scattered all over the valley and it how he describes the bones is he says these are very dry bones is the description which is given so um let's talk about chicken when you cut chicken and you know you are the 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 you know you eat the chicken and then you throw the bones the bone is still very wet very moist especially the marrow which is there inside the bone that is still moist and wet now you leave it out there for one year in the mud and after one year you look at that bone now that bone is not just dry on the outside it's even dried up on the inside it's so completely dried up that that you can in, in no way can you call it a living thing anymore so these bones are in that condition this is a valley of extremely dry bones so what has happened the flesh is the skin is gone the flesh is gone uh, finally even the even the bone has become so dry that the marrow inside the bone has dried up that is the condition of the bones which are lying over there in that valley and god asks the question god asks ezekiel do you think these bones can live and ezekiel being a very wise man he answers in the correct manner maybe we can look at uh, ezekiel chapter 37 uh, verse 3 if someone could read out Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. He doesn't say yes or no because he doesn't know whether bones which are in that condition, is it even possible for them to live? He says, Lord, you know. I mean, I don't know. Lord, only you know whether these bones can be restored or not. So over here, in this vision, these bones are being compared to the nation of israel they have been subjected to punishment god has now brought nebuchadnezzar he's already taken away two batches of people so now all hope is gone it's like as if the nation has become dry bones so now god is saying your nation is in this condition do you think your nation will live again and ezekiel says lord you know I mean, you you decide you know what is best and uh, so in uh, you know if you were to read um, maybe if someone could read out ezekiel chapter 6 verse 7 ezekiel 6 verse 7 
the slain shall fall in your midst and you shall know that i am lord yeah so the lord is basically saying when i raise up these dry bones you know in this vision of uh, chapter 37 when i raise up these dry bones it will prove to you that nothing is impossible to me i can take even the driest deadest bones and i can bring them back to life so you people are thinking nebuchadnezzar has come two times has taken away two batches of people now there's no hope left but you know what a day will come when i can take this dry bones and make it into a living army that is the kind of power i have because when i breathe out my power into this nation once again there will be people who will rise up in righteousness yes there will be people who you know who will not repent who will uh, you know just fade into the judgment but there will be a remnant which will survive because god will breathe into that remnant help them to recognize him as their lord and savior and accept him and then you know that remnant will grow into a new israel into a new restored israel so this vision of uh, of uh, dry bones is actually talking about the nation of israel and how one day even though complete judgment is going to come down upon them nebuchadnezzar will come a third time he will finish the job which he has started the judgment will be completed but one day god will restore so that is basically what this vision of valley of bones is talking about you know people take this passage and then they bring all kinds of other meanings to it but this is basically what the passage is talking about in its actual context um so um chapters 40 to 48 uh, they talk about end time events they talk about the coming of the messiah they talk about the new temple which will one day be established uh, about you know the kingdom of god which will be established in the end times all those things are mentioned in your uh, chapters 40 to uh, 48 now uh, exactly with what purpose was ezekiel called into this prophetic ministry what did god want him to uh, achieve so for that uh, we need to understand a little background we know most of the background because of the book of jeremiah we talked about all the things which were which happened in the last few years you know before um, nebuchadnezzar comes for the third time and and burns up the place uh, so we already are familiar with the details um, but just for us to go back to jeremiah chapter 28 where you get to know a little bit of what was going on in those last days so at this time uh, you know the um, the siege has already been laid all right so uh, the babylonian army is already surrounding the city so at that time you have a false prophet named hananiah very influential man everyone believes him everyone trusts in him so he's been you know giving false prophecies and this is basically what he has been saying so in jeremiah chapter 28 verse 3 we see that this is what he is saying he is saying or maybe someone can read out uh, verses 3 and 4 uh, jeremiah 28 3 and 4 within two full years i'll bring back to this place all the vessels of the lord's house that nabukadnezar king of babylon took away from this place and carried to babylon and i'll bring back to this place jeconiah the son of jehoiakim king of juda will all the captives of juda who went to babylon say the lord for i'll break the yoke of the king of babylon So Hananiah has been happily going around and telling everyone don't worry it's true that he has come and attacked two times but God is going to break the yoke of Babylon so in two years time everything that we have lost will come back all the you know gold and uh, silver articles which have which were taken from the temple they will all be restored back to us uh, Jehoiakim who was taken away as a prisoner he'll also come back all the exiles who went they will all come back and so these are the kind of prophecies which are being given and these prophecies are being transmitted all the way to the exiles who are living right now in babylon so the people over there who are in exile are feeling very happy they're thinking oh good two years we can manage somehow at the end of two years we'll be able to go back home but what has jeremiah been telling them you're going to be here away for a very very long time and they are not believing him they are believing the false prophets and so um at that time in in jeremiah chapter 28 you know jeremiah uh, comes uh 
with an object lesson. He literally is wearing a yoke on his back. And so he comes to Hananiah and he says, you know what, this is what um, uh, God is saying, because you are giving false prophecies, God is saying that the people will be in uh, under a yoke of Babylon for a long time. And you who are giving false prophecies, you will be uh, dead within one year. And then it says in the in verse 17, in the seventh month of the same year, Hananiah the prophet died. So these were the kind of false prophecies which were being given, creating hope in the exiles who are living out there. And so the exiles are kind of getting ready to start a strike, to start a rebellion, to somehow start a fight and go back to their own nation. But what has God said? Don't rebel, settle down. Accept the fact that punishment has come and you have to endure it for a long time to come. But they are not accepting the word of the Lord. They want to start a rebellion because false hope has been created by the false prophets. And so in that situation, Jeremiah, in, in Jeremiah chapters 28 and 29, we get to know that Jeremiah sends a letter from here to the exiles who are living in Babylon. And he says to them, please settle down in the land. Don't create any confusion. Pray for the peace of Babylon and start building your houses because you're going to be over there for 70 years. And God is not doing this to you because he hates you. He has a hope and a future for you. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, we kind of pull it out of context and we use it for just about everything we feel like using it for. But this is the actual context where God is telling them something very painful which they don't want to hear. They have, they've been listening to the false prophets and they have been feeling very happy. Oh, in two years, we'll come back to our land. But God says, accept my judgment. Submit to me. Start praying for the peace of Babylon. Don't rebel against it. Settle down. Build your houses because you're going to be here for 70 years. And that sounds very bad that you're going to be in a foreign land for 70 years. But don't worry. I'm not doing this to you to destroy you. I'm doing this to give you a future and a hope. And what God said, God fulfilled. At the end of 70 years, they were in such a nice state, they didn't even want to come back to Jerusalem. Most of the people, you know, they, they, don't, they don't even return back. Only a small percentage actually come back to the, to the land of Jerusalem because now God has blessed them so much in the land of punishment. So this uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 is actually a very amazing verse, which is saying, even though I'm doing these bad things to you right now, continue to trust me, continue to obey me, submit to me, because if you do that, you will discover, I'm not telling this unpleasant thing to you to, to harm you, I'm telling it to bless you for your own good. So that actually is the message you know, of Jeremiah 29, 11. And so at that time, Ezekiel rises up as a prophet, over there in Babylon to tell the people to listen to the Lord and not create confusion. So around that time is when Ezekiel would have started his ministry. And how does his ministry start? It starts with a you know very spectacular vision. And that's basically as he's having the vision, God talks to him, God commissions him, God tells him, I need you to become a prophet and speak to these people, all the things which are going to happen to them, the truth not what the false prophets are saying. I will give you true words of prophecy, of judgment, which will happen. And you must convey that to the people who are living here in exile. So this entire uh, book happens not in Jerusalem. It's happening in Babylon, in the place of exile, before the final attack. The final attack of Nebuchadnezzar has not yet happened. The temple is still standing. The walls of Jerusalem are still secure. At that time, this book of Ezekiel has been, you know, the words of prophecy over here have been um, given, at least the first 39 chapters, you know, are given at this particular point of time. So we'll come back from our break and look at uh, this book in further detail. Thank you.